Hi, welcome to Marvelous Mysteries, the podcast. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Jaden. And we're going to tell you about the mysteries we found this week, but first we're going to answer some questions about whatever. Okay, so the first question is kind of interesting. Well, I'll save that one to the end, actually, because it's the most interesting, I think. Okay. Um, so the first one is, what is your favorite cleaning activity? Cleaning activity? Yeah. I love, like, going through things. But That's kind of a vague term, but, like, clothes and stuff like that, and like, just, like, purging Okay. Like, I love doing that so much. I okay. Know. I just like cleaning in general, but that's probably my favorite. I like, like, spraying things and wiping things down. Like, oh, I really? like wiping out con-, con... I like wiping off <laughs> counters. I like spraying things. I like the smell of the sprays. Um, and it's nice. I don't know. Like, I like cleaning the oven. I don't like, like, scrubbing, like, really hard yeah. and nitty-gritty. But I just like cleaning and wiping surfaces down. Like, cleaning mirrors, cleaning off the counter. That would be my favorite. And then what's your least favorite cleaning activity? I feel like, well, I would say I feel like mine would be the wiping down stuff. But, mm-hmm. like, it depends on what it would be for. Like, I'm very bad at, like, wiping down stuff in my bedroom, like, dusting, basically. Like, I'm yeah. really bad at doing that. I don't like, I guess I do, don't mind dusting. I just don't do it very often. Yeah. Um. My least favorite is, like folding laundry and like more specifically hanging up clothes oh really yeah i don't like hanging it's like always super irritating and like you would think because i have all these clothes hung up in this closet that i would like it but it's just because they don't have room in my dresser and they have to be i can't get a second i would need like two or three dressers for all this stuff i'm pretty mm-hmm. sure um i don't like hanging up clothes and i have to do it all the time like in high school my room I used to put them on my bed and just leave them there, and then I put them on the floor. Yeah. So like, my room, my mom would be like, "Your room's messy." I'm like, "She's like," and I'm like, "But they're all clean clothes. So it's not that bad." But it is. It's like gross. Okay. Then the most interesting one is like, why are you interested in like mysteries or whatever, or and like what got you into it? Like what event? Yeah, occurred? I don't want to think. <laughs> All right. Well, I, since I come up, yeah, since you, I research these, yeah, I would already know. I've had a chance to think about it, but um, so I don't know why. I guess I like mysteries and murder. I guess I just like them like naturally. But the thing that got me into it was um, I think this is what I think looking back on my life. Um, so in like when I was like pretty young, there was like like a Casey, you know, Casey Anthony, the little, or no, Casey Anthony was the, I can't remember if it's the daughter or the mom now. I think it's the little girl. Sorry. I'm just double checking, checking. Okay. I was searching Casey Anthony and the first thing that came up was her Casey Anthony feet. <sighs> Anyways, <laughs> her daughter was Kaylee. Okay. So Kaylee was like a little girl who went missing And her mom was, like, a suspect in her murder. She's been found not guilty. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people still think she did it. But there was, like, a special. I used to sleep in my parents' room. And the TV was on a lot at night. And I woke up in the middle of the night. And I was definitely too young to be watching this, like, (laughs) investigative discovery or whatever report on it. But I watched the whole thing in the middle of the night. And, like, my parents didn't know. So it's, like, not like they allowed me to watch this. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And then I naturally just liked, like scooby-doo a lot and stuff when yeah. i was little and then i think my mom used when i was like older like in middle school my mom really liked investigation discovery the like tv channel yeah, yeah or that yeah. was on a lot and so then i started watching those and that's how i like then i watched like criminal minds and stuff and then i it went in from there and i listened to podcasts whatever but i think that like the casey anthony thing when i was like it's definitely too young to be watching mm-hmm. that, but like I don't, I don't even think my mom knows now that I did that in the middle of the night. But <laughs> surprise, yeah, surprise, <laughs> I guess. But I don't know what mine would be because I feel like I never really had. Like I feel like even now, although I don't mind them, I feel like you, you enjoy them much more than I do. Even though I don't, yeah, I mean, even mm-hmm. though I still like, enjoy doing like mysteries and stuff like that, because I don't, I don't. I don't feel like I really ever had, like, a point in my life where, like, something like that where it's, like, you know, I saw something or... Mm-hmm. That, like, I guess I might have, but, like, not that I can remember at the moment, but I did watch a lot of, like, like, start off, like, you know, like, Scooby-Doo, and yeah. then, like, Murder, She Wrote, and then I watched, like, Psych and Castle, and, like, I still don't really watch that many, like, dark mystery shows, 
Mm-hmm. Um, but then, like, I mean, like, I always watch my sister and my mom play like, Nancy Drew games. Um, and I always, like, remember really liking those. Yeah, I don't really know. I think I like the more, like, puzzle part of it. Not really the more, like... Mm-hmm. I like mysteries more than murder, I think. <laughs> yeah. I like true crime, but I um, I do like like mysteries or like out like interesting stories kind of too. I don't yeah. know. I like the I like the intrigue or like that's kind of wild, like anything. Also just like I like hearing about people's lives and also kinda like kinda like gossip, which like to this <laughs> this is kinda like a little bit of tea or something, you know, oh, like like whatever. I don't know. So, or, like, I like stories and hearing about things. Yeah. I like to be in the know. So I'm guessing that's why. Yeah. I feel like, like I already said, I feel like mine's kind of like that, too. It's just I think you have a stronger... Like, I think mine's more... I think I'm just, like, more... I'm more creepy or, like, I like more... <laughs> more like, creepy. I, like, realized, like, the other week, like, it's, like, I never considered myself, like, creepy or, like, I don't know, like, morbid or whatever. But, like looking at all the things I like and all the shows and stuff, I was like, I definitely have a little bit bit of that in me. And, like, my family doesn't, like, my sister doesn't necessarily, like, she kind of likes true crime or something, but, like, I definitely have, like, a sense of that, that, like, a lot of, like, in high school, for example, I wouldn't, like, have considered myself part of that group. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, not that it matters, but I was like, I definitely have a lot of, a lot in common with, like, them and, like, these people that, like, were super into, like, like the more morbid like I, I like halloween and like all this dark stuff like oh yeah so not that halloween is even dark but like well it depends on how far you take it i think for when it comes to halloween yeah um, a lot of it's just cutesy and fun but that's my halloween <laughs> it's like charlie brown pumpkin patch episode kind of halloween that's my my vibe <laughs> that's where i yeah. i stop i don't um, like like a lot of gore but like i'm like i like 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 Nightmare Before Christmas is like I didn't mind that yeah it's like kind of creepy but like kind of cute and like weird but sweet and like oh, yeah. I like it and it's like different and kind of weird but that's what, my hell my Halloween I don't like like the nat like really gory no, I like hate that type of stuff so much I like don't. whatever I like creepy stories but not like ghost stories because I don't really I don't super believe in ghosts I don't think so like it's yeah it's kind of hard to be like oh so it doesn't happen. really. <laughs> scare me like when I was little it did more so but it would be hard I mean you could tell me like if something around town happened that was like this girl like someone she got into her car and then someone was in her car that would freak me out because it happens in real life but if you told me like like that story about like I'm trying to remember oh like the girl with the ribbon around her neck that doesn't freak me out did you listen it's like I don't know I feel like that sounds very familiar it's it was in a children's book I'm pretty sure like a children's creepy oh. book at one point, it might be older, but she, it's like this girl. She has a ribbon around her neck the whole life, her whole life, and like um, oh. everyone's like, "Why do you have that?" And she marries this guy, and he keeps asking. She's like, "I'll tell you like when it's time," and then she takes it off, and her head falls yeah, off. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but like, and there's like a book, and I think it's I want to say it's like a children's book, and there's no, like I feel that no, I feel like you're right because I don't know if it's necessarily a children's book, or maybe there was like a story that I read that was similar to it. Because I remember there was this one book in, like, third grade that I would sometimes look through, and I don't know why, but, well, well this kind of goes back, I think, to why I got into mysteries in the first mm-hmm. place. It was mostly, like, through reading stories and stuff. Yeah. But anyways, but, like, I remember this being this one book, and I don't remember what it was called, but I think it was kind of, like, like spooky stories and, yeah. like, illustrations, and I think it might have been in that, I remember, like, reading, like, a couple others. Now that I'm saying this out loud, like, third grade, I feel like I should have been, like, there's, like, this one story about, like, to about how, like, it was so hot outside that, like, the, like, the character, like, whatever the poem or thing was that was, like, taking off, like, their skin, like, their clothes and then their skin because it was so warm out until, like, they're left in bones. It sounds much more creepy, I think, which when is you like, say it like that. Like, it's, yeah, it's, like, children's <laughs> songs and stuff, which are, like, that's whatever. But then, like, when you actually think about someone, like, just peeling their skin off till it's like, bones, Ugh. it's so nasty. Like, <laughs> but, I mean, a lot of children's songs and stuff are really gross right. and creepy because they're, like, or, like, the... The grim, isn't it grim fairy tales or whatever? The yeah. original are very creepy. I should and... bring my. I had the the book of like all the oh, grim the fairy tales. Ones. Or like I found it for eight dollars. Wow. I should bring it one time. We can read them. Yeah, those are like they're creepy and weird and like yeah. That's how kids' stories were. I think because they were like to warn a child, not to do, whatever yeah. they wanted, whatever the thing was. But yeah, I just like I like like. A roller coaster. I like. I like a scandal. I like 
something interesting, I guess. Interesting to me. A lot of people, like, don't want to hear it. Like, I can't, like... Like, I told this story about this girl that, like, survived being, like, almost attempt... Like, she survived someone trying to murder her. Mm -hmm. And I told um, Isaac about it, and he's like, please don't tell me anything like that ever again. It's like, I can't... Feel, like, it's just so funny to me that, like... Like, if someone told me, like, an, a little bit of detail, I'd be like, tell me every single thing about that. Because yeah. I want to know. But there are certain things that aren't interesting to me, too. I don't know. For some reason, I feel like sometimes I get more, like, creeped out, like, spooked or whatever. If someone tells me it, rather than if I just read it. And I don't know why that is. I think it's, like, when I'm reading it, I'm like... You it's feel just... removed. Yeah, maybe. It. And then when it's like, in real life, they're like, oh, like, this happened, you're kind of like... Uh-huh. They're like, that's not nice. Yeah. I think I just want to know. I think I just want to know, like, everything that's going on, too. So, that's probably why. I don't know. But, yeah. And I'm wondering when there's going to be another thing. I guess there hasn't been so much because, maybe because of politics and stuff, but, like, like there was, like, the OG tr OJ trial and everyone watched oh, yeah, that. Yeah. Or, like, um... Like, even Casey, Casey Anthony, like, mm -hmm. a lot of people watched her trial, but I feel like there hasn't really been anything like that. Or maybe yeah. I'm just oblivious to it, but I'll probably watch it. Whatever that is. Um, anyways, that's all the questions. Um, did you go first last week or did I? I think I went. You went first? I think, yeah, no, yeah, I definitely went because I remember how horrid... I was, like, having such a hard time reading whatever I was okay. reading. And then I was like, you just go. <laughs> just go. I'm done with this. All right, so mine. I have a lot of pictures to show you with mine. So mine's interesting. It's the Voynich Manuscript. Okay. I'm going to show you how it's spelled. I meant to look it up. Voynich. Voynich, I, I think. Guess. Yeah. Um. So, um. basically, the Voynich Manuscript is an il illustrated codex handwritten in an unknown and possibly meaningless writing system. So the val vellum, see, there's a lot of words in here I meant to look up, but I didn't. Yeah, it's, it's vellum. It's vellum, um, which is like the animal skin that they use to mm -hmm. write on it, um, has been carbon dated to the early 15th century, which is what they dated it to, which is around 1404 to 1439. I don't know, 1990, yeah, 1438, sorry, 1338. It's like, it sounds weird because it's such a low number rather than yeah, saying yeah. 2000 or 1999. But people think it may have been, it may have been composed during the, in Italy during the Italian Renaissance. So the manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, um, a Polish book dealer who purchased the book in 1912. Some of the pages are missing, but there's around 240 pages of it, and the text is written from left to right, um, and most pages have illustrations or diagrams, and some of the pages are foldable. The first confirmed owner, owner of this book was um, Gor Gorge Barsh... Hmm. Here, <laughs> just look at it. That'd be, it might be a weird to say George and then... Barisic, maybe? Bar Barisic, yeah. Bar Sorry, this Barret, is... Bresk, or... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's an alchemist from Prague, and he lived from 1585 to 1662. Um, he discovered it taking up space useless in his library. Um, he also tried to investigate the manuscript's origins, but nothing came of it. So it's been studied by many professional and amateur crypto cryptographers, um, American, British code breakers from World War One and World War Two. The manuscript has never been deciphered, like, officially. There are people that have thought they've kind of, like, cracked mm -hmm. it, but it's never officially been confirmed or whatever. So, the mystery of its origins and its purpose or meaning is unknown. Um, so, right now, in 1969, so where it resides now, it was donated to Yale University's um, Rare Books and manuscript library. So that's, I guess, where it sits now. Um, so the purpose of the book, like I said, is unknown because it's just lit written in this language. Um, the overall impression given by, like, the manuscript is it's meant to serve as, like, a pharma pharmacology book or something. Like, um, it addresses topics of medieval or early modern medicine. 
Uh, but the only problem is the illustrations are kind of weird, so they feel fueled many theories about the book's origins, the context, and the text of the book. So I will show you some of them. I just included to show you, like, what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. They're just, like, very strange, yeah. which, like, um, like, people just don't know where it comes from. There's, like, a basins and tube section in the um, veil ne- ne- ecology veil-necology or something like that, which is therapeutic use of baths, which, that sounds nice. (laughs) (laughs) Those sections are interpreted to be alchemy, but they also, like, don't bear any resemblance to the alchemy equipment of the period that it's written. And then some people thought, like, just a conspiracy theory was that it's a book written by a woman for, like, medicine or healing or something, and um, that it's either, like, coded because women were just, like, a lot of books that they wrote and stuff were burned. Mm -hmm. So the book was either secret or there were several copies and it was a secret. Um, Mine's also really short today, but um, because there's just not like, I didn't go into too much of the history, sorry, because a lot of it's speculation. And I also didn't go into like the people that thought they broke the codes. I just went into the theories Mm -hmm. of what this could be and how, like what it is and like the theories of like, whether it's a cipher, a code, or whatever. So, um... Did, sorry, did they say what language it is? Or if it, is no, it it's like a language unknown. that no one knows? It's totally okay. unknown. Okay. They can't read it or decipher right. it okay. or anything. So many hypotheses have been developed um, about the language, which they called Boykinese, because, again, they don't know. Right. So, um, the first theory is that it's a cipher. Um... So they think it me- contains meaningful text some of some European language, but was intentionally rendered um, by mapping it into the Voynich manuscript alphabet through a cipher of some sort um, with an algorithm that operated on individual letters. Um, this was the working hypothesis for most of the 20th century deciphering attempts. So a lot of people that tried to fix it were this. And so if it is a cipher, like no one would be able to crack it necessarily because there's so mm-hmm. many things it could be, you know. So the main argument for the cipher theory is that it's difficult to explain a European author using a strange alphabet like they do in this book mm-hmm. without trying to, without the reasoning being that they are trying to hide information. Um, and the counter argument to that is that almost all cipher systems can that are consistent with that era, um, like, don't match what this was. But... I feel like if it was a good cipher, then it wouldn't be consistent right. with the era. It would be, like, something really weird and unique. Um, so then the next one is code. Like, that it's a code. Um, so this theory says that the words are codes to be looked up in a dictionary or code book. The main evidence of this theory is that the internal structure and length Distributions of many words are similar to those of Roman numerals, which at the time would be natural for a natural choice for codes. Um, however, the book-based ciphers would be only good for really short message- messages because they're so tedious to um, figure out and to write. So, like, if each number corresponds with like a whatever, and this book is 240 pages, you know, mm-hmm. so like if one if this means right, one or right, whatever, right. it takes it would take forever. So they were thinking, like, maybe they didn't. That's the reasoning against the site, or the code, sorry. Um, Okay, so then there's also the theory that it's just shorthand. So in 1943, Joseph Marin Feely claimed that the manuscript was scientific, a scientific diary written in some sort of shorthand. Um... Sorry. So someone, according to Dimperio, this was a late, but in a system of abbreviated forms not considered acceptable by other scholars who rejected his readings of the text. So that's just kind of like, he said, thought it could be written in shorthand, but like, it's not really accepted or anything. Um, Okay. Which, like, it could be written in shorthand. And I'll I'll go into, like, which theory I thought it was the most, too. And then, so then, the next one is Dagonography. Um, 
which says that most of the text is just meaningless, but contains meaningful information hidden in inconspicuous details. For example, like, it's all meaningless, but the second letter of every word means yeah, something, right. or the second word, whatever, and the whatever rule they want to make. Um, this technique is called stenogra- steganography. Steganography? I don't know. I don't know, but I feel like I'm saying that strangely. Um, stenography, maybe? What, stick? I've heard thought stenography was spelled different. Well, there's no, I think because there's no A-N in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Fred. No, it's okay. Okay, sorry. Um, this technique, oh, oops. This is unlikely, though, because it seems like the little words and letters are not arranged on anything. Um, and usually, I guess, they're, they're on some sort of grid. But this is really hard to disprove or prove because it's so hard to find what it could be. And there's so many variations of what it could be. It seems like there's just not many clues. Like, they don't know who wrote this or any really information. It's just kind of this random thing. Um, people say, like, maybe the meaningful in text could be con- encoded in the length or, like, the chap of certain pen strokes. But the pen strokes seem natural, they say, if you're just writing on the animal skin um so like all of these i feel like are really hard to prove or disprove because like you kind of need some clues from the era and it seems like there's just not very many on this right so okay so then the next thing is that it's a natural language and i had to cut a lot of this out because it's like a lot of like linguists like theory that was kind of hard to like wordy and hard to understand like a lot of grammar things um, basically, they do a st- they did a statistical analysis of the text, which reveals patterns similar to those of natural languages, which is interesting that they could tell that. Mm-hmm. And one of them is called word entropy, which entropy is like a disorder, lack of order, which is interesting that I didn't know that there was like, that was like a thing at all for like languages. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it's similar to English or Latin. Um, in 2013, Diego Amonico, um, argued that the manuscript is mostly compatible with natural languages and more incompatible with random text. And a lot of these people use computer programs, I think. And, um, one of the things that they were, I can't remember if this is this one or like for the constructed language one, I think. I think it was the natural, the construction of language theory, but they used a computer program that, like, would somehow, like, do something with the prefixes and, like, the structure of the sentences mm-hmm. that I just kind of, like, I didn't go into that much detail because it's, sorry if, like, you think that's interesting and, like, I don't have that, <laughs> but, like, it was just, like, hard to under- explain, explain and even understand to me, so, sorry, it's, like, information, okay. but. Well, you said it's only a, a, one of the theories, so. Yeah, so it's just, like, background on how they came up with that analysis right. basically so um one of a linguist uh Jackie's guy suggests that the text is just a li- very little known language um so in 1976 James Archild of the National Security Agency and he was a linguist in Indo-European languages proposed that it was um written in an unknown North German dialect so like in the 1400s too i'm sure that if there was a language there were certain languages that were just spoken um right i know like for example in africa um when my cousin lived there um the i can't i know i can't remember the name of the language there was french because she lived in guinea but then the village her village she lived in i think was malinke they had their own language called malinke that they use and she became fluent in because a lot of them They kind of spoke French, but that was just, like, what they had come up with in the village she lived. And then there's, like, yeah. So there's, like, a lot of different, I'm sure, like, a lot of different countries have their own, like, small language or even dialect of the language that's very hard to translate. And then if... I'm sure back then there was so much crossing over. Yeah, there's a lot of different ones, and they probably didn't keep as good a record as, like, their language, maybe, of their village or of their town, whatever. So, um, so that's one of the things I, like, it could be in. So, in 2014, 
a team led by Diego Amico of the um, University of Sao Paulo's Institute of Mathemati Mathematical and Computer Sciences published a paper detailing a study using statistical methods to analyze, to analyze the relationships of the words in this text. So this is what I was talking about, um, which is kind of interesting that they can do this with like this program mm -hmm. and stuff. They are able to discover the manuscript's keywords and create a three-dimensional model of the text structure and word frequencies. Wow. Which I think they did it with just like a computer and mathematical stuff. Um, I can't. I can't remember if it's on a computer program or stuff now, but um, basically their conclusion was. In 90% of the cases in the book, the systems are similar to um, other well-known texts, such as like the Bible, just like the way I'm guessing that the speech is, and they're able to find like keywords and stuff just based mm -hmm. on like the structures of the sentence and whatever, and which indicates that it is an actual language. Um, so the next theory is a construction, a constructed language. Um, so the secular internal structure of the manuscript, um, it has been suggested that it's a constructed language. Uh, the concept of a construction a constructed language, sorry, is quite old but still postdates the general accepted origin of the manuscript by two centuries. So it could happen. This could repeat explain the repetitious nature of the text, um, but nobody's been able to assign like a positive meaning to any of the prefixes or suffixes in the manuscript and there's more like they just haven't been able to prove it which is a lot of the which is the gist of a lot of these it's like yeah that's great it could be that but we just can't prove it because we don't have any like information on right, it right right um so the next one is that it's just a hoax um <laughs> it's a lie yeah that like <laughs> Uh, if no one's able to extract meaning from this book, then perhaps it's because there's no meaningful context in the first place, is what it said. In 2013, a computer scientist, Gordon Rugg, showed that the text had characteristics similar to the manuscript that could have been produced. Oh, this is what I was like. He used a computer program. Like, if you had a table with remixes, steams, and suffixes, and I didn't even finish that. Like, there's, like, he made a table of, like... Yeah, all, all of grammar things, I guess. Uh, and he like was able... To, yeah, things. like they were able to create a text similar um, with a computer program, I'm guessing. Um, which I don't know. Maybe it's just a good program and it is a real language. Um, yeah. But I don't know. And then the final one is that it's in tongues or um, glossolia, which they say is speaking in tongues. Or... It's also like channeling or outsider art. So it's not necessarily like tongues, like how it is in the Bible, where just like saying nonsense or whatever, but like it could have been, and like when I went off of that, like the author could have been very compelled to write large amounts of text that resemble a stream of consciousness. So it's been pointed out to so the draw, like the drawings in the text, one of the Someone who worked on this said that she's drawn some very similar things when she has severe mind migraines. Uh -huh. So they were. She was thinking that someone had a very huge migraine or was in a trance state of this like glossolalia um, to like, and that's why they draw drew all these drawings, and they were just very compelled to do this. And obviously, this theory is impossible to prove or. In or disprove because we can't read the text. We can't do anything. And I was thinking, like, maybe it's just someone that was mentally ill or schizophrenic or maybe just, like... Just ill in general. Like, yeah, or just writing down their own ideas or whatever. Right. And now it's just, like, like very, like, interesting mystery to all these, like, scholars and uh, crypto cryptonologists. Mm -hmm. Um but it's just like someone's random ramblings or like maybe they were schizophrenic, mentally ill, or maybe they, maybe they just were writing random things or they invented their own language kind of, or whatever, you know, maybe it's just a creative thing and they drew in it and stuff. Yeah. But no one knows what it is. Most of the theories are just really hard to prove or disprove and they just haven't been able to like figure out anything about it. Right. Which is interesting. 
and like it seems like there's not really much on where it came from who owned it who wrote it which i mean obviously it's hard to find something like yeah. that when it's that old it's like what so 400 they, 600 years old the thir- 1300s you said 1400s, 1400s. yeah because you said that what like it, it didn't say like how they came across it right or like it didn't have yeah, like, a, so a specific like, origin origin point not really like there's the first there's one the first owner which i mentioned he found it and it just randomly in his library he said he found it okay. just unnecessarily taking up space so he sold it i'm guessing and that was in 1500 oh okay. in the 1500s yeah. his, well he was alive from 1585 to 1662 so somewhere around that like 100 or 200 years later somehow he came across it and he's the first confirmed owner right so they don't really know anything about who had it first and the manuscript was named after um wilfred voynich um because he and he purchased the book in 1912 so i'm guessing that's when they like became aware he showed people it Mm -hmm. um so it's just named after him. It's not named after who. Actual owner. Yeah, because they don't know okay. who it is. But um, I was going to say, I think Miss, maybe this is what like one of the theories you said was. Sorry, I can't remember. Um, it was just like, or maybe I wonder if it was like even just someone who maybe was like more of a kind of like a traveler kind of person. They were mm. creating their own language, right, from all these to other languages that they mm-hmm. heard, and so like I wonder if which like. Which is why I think one of the things you said was that it might have been, like, a mix between Latin and another language. Yeah, and, like, a, I think just North American. Yeah. So, it so could I wonder be. if it was something like that. Yeah, there's, like, a lot of things it could be, you know. Like, it's interesting because there's just, like, no way of necessarily knowing unless you somehow uncover more. Or somehow find out where it came from. Find, like, mm-hmm. the, you know I mean, like. Or if they found another thing that was similar. Like it, yeah. Yeah. And there was information on that. But it's just sitting at Yale, I guess. I think and I could be wrong. That's just the last place that they Yeah. I think. So that's all huh. mine. I don't know, I like reading like I like reading those type of things. I don't know how you find yours. <laughs> I feel like I always look and I'm like I don't I can never find like I just look up I have a, there's a list I've been going off of and oh, I'm okay. just like trying to force myself to like I always what happens is I always like search things and I have a list of like ideas and I'm like, eh, I'll like I'll save that. And I'll just try to find a new one. I just look up strange unsolved mysteries or, like, yeah. if I want something creepy, I'll look up creepy or disturbing. But usually I just look, like, interesting or strange ones. I wonder if we'll ever, like, overlap. Or do one. I know. I was thinking about <laughs> that. Point. If we'll ever do the same one. But. We'll find out, I guess, I suppose. Yeah, I know. But. Um. Okay. Oh, next year good with that yeah we'll have some we'll have the next person go next not you okay. <laughs> the other person <laughs> the other person that's in this small room with us um mine's pretty short like i said and i didn't procrastinate wow that took me a while to get there yeah i didn't procrastinate today i wrote this baby out myself wow it's fancy know, this better be the best one uh, it's definitely not gonna be <laughs> the writing's probably gonna be it's a little the shabby <laughs> it's the worst one ever <laughs> okay so mine's called the gatton murders okay so, the Gat murders was a triple homicide that occurred on December 26th, uh, 26th to the 27th of 1898. Um, it happened a little less than a couple of miles from the town of Gatton, Queensland, Australia. Uh, siblings Michael Murphy, who was 29, and his sisters uh, Nora, who was 27, and Teresa Ellen, who was 18, were killed between 8, or, oh my gosh, 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. They were returning home from a dance that had been canceled... Um, their bodies were found, when their bodies were found, it was seen that Michael had been shot and bludgeoned, Nora had been strangled and bludgeoned, and Teresa had been bludgeoned twice. Oh, wow. So it's kind of like an overall thing. So, the Murphy, uh, family grew up on a farm, um, at Blackfellows Creek, about eight miles from Gatton and 61 miles from Brisbane. Uh, Michael worked on a government experimental farm near Westbrook at the time, when he returned home for the holidays on December 26th, which is, I can't say 26th. <laughs> 26th? Yeah, I can't get the both. <laughs> Anyways, that's Boxing Day, I guess, for uh, Australia and I think okay. also, also Britain, right? They have a Boxing Day. I don't know what day it is. Okay. On. Anyways, Boxing Day, um, at 8 p.m., he took his sister Nora and Teresa Ellen um, and he left, they left home to attend a dance that was held at Gatton Hall. 
Uh, when they arrived at 9 p.m., they found out that the dance was canceled, and they started their way back home. Um, and then the following morning, um, they hadn't returned at this point, so the following morning, their mother asked her son-in-law, William Menil, to go to Gatton and find Michael, Nora, and Teresa. Uh, when William had arrived on a road to Gatton, he recognized the tracks from his sulky, which is a type of cart that was pulled by horses. Um, he recognized the tracks from his sulky that Michael had borrowed the previous night, um, and he followed the tracks and found his sibling and found the siblings later on. Uh, William found the victims in a field a little over a mile from Gatton. Michael and Teresa Ellen were lying back to back within two feet of each other. Nora lay in the same east-west orientation on a neatly spread rug 28 feet to the east. Uh, the sisters had their hands tied behind their backs with handkerchiefs. Um, the sulky faced south 17 and a half feet from Michael and 36 feet from Nora. The horse had been shot in the head and lay between the shafts, um, and their legs were arranged with the feet pointing to the west. I think they're talking about the siblings, by the way. They didn't specify who okay. they were, but I think they're talking about their, their legs, as in the siblings. Um, but their feet were pointing west. Um, the oddity of the crime scene has never been repeated in any other, any other Australian crimes. Okay. That was the first time that's kind of ever and only happened. So William contacted William R.L., Arel, I think you say it, was in charge of the Gatton Police Station. Um, the investigating officers didn't arrive until 48 hours after after the discovery of the bodies. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and I kind of go into more explanation about that later on. Um, so they moved the bodies to Gilbert Hotel at 4 p.m. Oh, and at 4 p.m., Dr. Von Lossberg, a government medical officer at Ipswich, Ip, yeah, Ipswich arrived between 4 and 5 p.m. and started an autopsy. So they find out that Michael had been shot and struck with a blunt object on the right side of his head. Teresa Ellen had her skull fractured by two blows to the left side of her head. Uh, from the wounds and the position of the bodies when found, they figure that Michael and Teresa were sitting upright back to back when struck. So they're kind of hit at the same time, I think, is what they're saying. Okay. Um, Nora was struck on the left side of her head, pulverizing her skull to the point where she, her brain began to protrude. Yeah. Um... And Nora also had a harness strap tied around her neck, tight enough to cause death. And then they also had figured that both the sisters might have been raped um, via the handle of a whip. Okay. But I don't know if it, if they ever disproved that or they proved that point or not. I think it was kind of like that mm -hmm. was their theory. Very unsettling theory. <laughs> um, I wonder how they proved that in the 1800s. Yeah, I don't know. I think they just did tests for bodily things. But they, could they test <laughs> for that then? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think they... Yeah, I, I guess I don't really know. I didn't... I don't think it really specified. No, sorry. I was just... I didn't mean to no, bring no, no, track. No, no, no. You're, no, you're good. I, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure how much... Or if it's more like context or... I, I yeah, always, like, underestimate how much, like, the past they have out there. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So... Yeah, they, they might have been able to. I think they... If I remember correctly, I think they they try to do at least some tests, but I don't know if... Okay. They ever really got anything from it. Um, so William Neal had later said that although Michael's hands were not tied when he first found the body, he said it appeared that his hands had been tied behind his back at some point, um, and in one of his hands there was an open purse, a uh, money, like, money pouch. Um, although other evidence claimed that Michael's hands were not tied, a breech, a breaching strap that, which goes around a horse, um, to, like, harness them in and stuff, was nearby, and then an empty purse was lying in a short distance from the body. When they removed his body from the crime scene, Michael was now found to have to have the breaching strap between his untied hands and the empty purse in the other. So they suspect that someone may have untied Michael at some point in order to get the purse. Okay. So I think they're like he he had like the markings of being tied up, but it was mm -hmm. never or but then he was untied. Um so Arell took no notes while at the site. He didn't interview anyone present and did nothing to try and protect the crime scene from the people arriving. So he was. Um, so he just like let everyone walk through. Yeah. So like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, in Gatton, Arell had requested that a telegram be marked urgent, only to be told that the police had no authority to send urgent telegrams, which was false. And okay. Arell was, was like, why? Yeah, Arell was later criticized for not knowing that he had the authority to send telegrams. Okay. Um, and as he waited for a reply instead of returning immediately to the crime scene, or sorry, he he wait. He stayed there to wait for a reply instead of returning to the crime scene. The telegram was sent to the Brisbane Police Headquarters at 12.52 p.m. 
but since it was a holiday, it was not opened until 9 a.m. the next day, December 28th. Um, Aurel had assigned Thomas Wilson and William Devitt to look after the crime scene while he was gone, and they allowed the, t- the crime scene to be c- contaminated. So it was more of, like, them, not him, mm-hmm. but he had left them in charge, so, like, I, he still got some flack for it. Um, so, some suspects were... There's only really one main suspect that they found. Mm-hmm. Um, they thought that maybe, like, it could have been, like, several people that included, like, workers and daily members. Or, sorry, daily members. I don't, it corrected family to daily. Sorry, I read it out That's of instinct. <laughs> <laughs> um, it included workers and family members. Uh, they were under suspicion, but after five months of investigation, no one was ever charged with the murders. Um, the failure of the Queensland police who were supposed to solve the crime um, led to accusations of cover-ups and rumors of incest within the Murphy family. Hmm. Uh, the rumors were never resolved. Um, so Theo, Theo Farmer was the prime suspect. Um, he died known as Thomas Ferner in the Sydney Hospital on October 25th, 1900, which the, and like the police withheld that information from the public that he, hmm. I think that he was Thomas Ferner actually and then that he passed away. Um, and the police allegedly released one possible suspect without a thorough investigation as well, which I think, which if I believe I put down here later, um, was Theo or Thomas, whatever you want to call him. Okay. So they, they had him in custody, but then they released him. Mm-hmm. Um, so it later, that whole case and everything later became a subject of a Royal Commission in 1899. So the Royal Commission uh, was concerned with shortcomings in the police force and to a lesser extent the failures of the police forces in both the Oxley murder of December 14th and the Gatton murders on December 26th. Um, sorry. Okay, so that was just who like, the Royal Commission is. Um, so Daniel Murphy, which is the brother of the victims, was a police officer at police headquarters and received a telegram from a family friend on December 27th informing him of the murders. He applied for three days' leave, and it was granted, um, and he tried to catch the train to Gatton right away, but missed it. So he came back to the headquarters, and he went to the criminal investigation branch, but no action was taken by detectives, as there was a rumor spreading that the murders were a hoax. Um, okay. He eventually, and then, like, he, he left, uh, Daniel left again. He was able to catch a train at this point. Um, at 4 p.m., Inspector Frederick, <laughs> I don't know how to say this, Urquhart, Ur- <laughs> how do you say that? Urquhart, yeah, that, looks, Urquhart. that sounds correct. Okay. Was informed that the murders were not a hoax, but seeing as information didn't come through official channels, the commissioner was not informed until 9 p.m., which is what kind of caused the whole, like, them being late, like, mm-hmm. not arriving until 48 hours <laughs> after. Okay, yeah. Um... So, as I said, um, evidence did point to Theo Farmer, Farner, who was Thomas Day slash Thomas Ferner. So, he went by three names. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so they pointed to him, but he wasn't considered a suspect at first, because um, he suspected the family members at first. But he lived in a hut 900 feet away from the murder site. Um, a local woman claimed she saw a man on a fo- on foot chase... Sorry, she saw a man on foot chase the Murphy sulky as it made its way to the dance. The man stood opposite of the slip rails, blocking the little access to the road that led to the murder location. However, the woman was unable to identify him. So they were being followed the entire time, is yeah. what she says. The sibling said it. Okay. Um, Thomas Day had been seen by a number of people on previous nights walking along the same road. Others claimed that he had... He was seen washing blood from a pullover a few days later. Um, Constable Robert George Christie gave evidence at the Royal Commission that he suspected it was Day who was handed the revolver to use in the Oxley murder, which was then the same revolver used in the Gatton murders. Um, The revolver was found in the swamp paddock on on the Gatton side in 1906, where Day was employed. Um, Four chambers were spent and a total of four shots were fired in the Oxley and the Gatton murder case. Um, there was a rumor that perhaps Day was related to Edward, Lit- Edward Lytton Carcass Wilson, 
who was the prime suspect for the Oxley murder. Um, but then two weeks after the murders, um, and Day had been taken in, Day asked the police if he was needed for further investigation, but the police said no. Records show that he later enlisted for the same mili for the military, but left in May of 1899. The following year, Thomas Ferner, who was Day, right, um, was admitted to Sydney Hospital, suffering from self-inflicted gunshot wounds to the head. Okay. He died October 25th, 1900, and was identified by Inspector Eric Hart as Thomas Day. Hmm. Um, that's that's all I have for now. Because like, they never found out who it was that did right. it. Because nobody, although there was that lady who said she saw someone following them the entire time, it was too dark, she couldn't identify anything. And then um, I think I did read that, like, or maybe not. I was never mind. That's a lie. But yeah, so Thomas was like the main suspect for right. a while. And then he passed away by trying to kill himself. Hmm. Which I could see maybe he might have been the person if he tried. I don't know. You if know? he thought he was going to get caught or something. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, that's a little suspicious. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Like that's said, interesting, mine, though. Mine wasn't that long, and I didn't go too in-depth with it. Because although I did have time to write it all out, I did kind of wait till the last minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was still interesting. I mean, it's sad, but like I said, they didn't really have anything to go off of because... Right. It was like, although there was like, I did read that they, they were suspecting that whoever was behind the murders, they're like, it looked like the killings were done out of anger. Yeah, like they, of how, they were super gruesome. Yeah, of how bad they were and everything. I mean, like, they shot the horse. I'm like, you could have, like, let him live. He did nothing wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because that's, like, super gruesome. Mm -hmm. Or someone that was, like, crazy. Like, not, I don't, not crazy, but, like, just, like, going through, like, a little, right. like, deranged or something, maybe. Even if it wasn't personal against them. I don't know. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> um, well, that's all we have. You can, yeah. you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can um, like, subscribe. Comment. Com comment on YouTube or Instagram if you want to send us something that you want us to do. If you want us to answer one of your questions, you can comment it on YouTube or you can like DM us on Instagram, Twitter. You might be able to Facebook message us. Um, I don't know if I'll see it. <laughs> I, I'll see it, but I don't. I don't know how. I don't know. I don't think our Facebook page is the th thriving social no, yeah. media <laughs> thing right now. But um, you could probably message us on Facebook, um, and we'll answer your questions or do a mystery that if you Maybe want to hear us. In. Yeah, if you want to hear us do cover it or research it. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.